Big greetings to everyone. Welcome to the next panel discussion in the framework of the conference Towards a Meaningful Change, Gendered Foreign Policy and Practice. This panel discussion is about women's empowerment and gender equality in development cooperation. In particular, the panel aims to reflect on the following question. How do we ensure that the ideals of women's empowerment and gender equality do not wither away during the planning and implementation of development projects and programs? How do we measure progress in this area? What is the most desirable division of tasks, funds and responsibilities between the donors, for example, the Czech Republic and the international organizations, non-governmental development organizations, partner countries and receiving communities. Uh, the next cluster of questions concerns the donor landscape in terms of fulfillment of gender norms. Who is the best actor in this regard? And how about the Czech Republic and the other Central European donors? And then finally, we can also reflect on how does the COVID-19 pandemic change the landscape of development cooperation and gender equality and women's rights in it. To discuss these questions, we have here four special guests, each having a lot to say on these issues and each stemming from a different background. The first will present us with her thoughts, uh, Lisa Williams, who comes from the Global Partnerships and Policies Division in the OECD Development Cooperation Directorate. Lisa participates in this discussion on behalf of Paloma Duran y La Laguna from the same institution, who was announced to be on the panel, but who unfortunately could not make it today. The next speaker will be Maxi Usar, Strategic Planning and Gender Specialist and Director of Just Impact Consulting a person with immense experience with development projects on the ground and also with lobbying with donors. Then we will move to, to Wanda Malfas Chernorska, who is a sociologist in the Czech Women's Lobby Organization and a former development practitioner with experience in the Syrian borderlands. And the last but certainly not the least will speak Michaela Marksová Tominová, who is a Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs at the Czech Republic and who can therefore relate to our questions from within of this key Czech institution. I have to say that the viewers are more than welcome to pose questions to our speakers. There are two ways to ask questions. First, you can ask your questions live by clicking on the link that is just below the conference video. And the second way to ask a question is to write it in the section below the video. So now I would like uh, Lisa to present us with her contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, very, very much, Tomas. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I am, as Tomas mentioned, I work at the OECD and the Development Cooperation Directorate in a division on working on global partnerships and policies on gender equality, governance, conflict prevention issues, effectiveness in terms of aid effectiveness partnerships. And our head of division, uh, Dr. Paloma Duran de la Laguna, was sorry not to be able to join you today, but asked me to step into her shoes and try to give you a sense of some of the work that we're doing and to respond to the questions that Tomas has posed and help us to have an interesting debate together uh, today on our, on our important agenda. Um, I would say that today I'm particularly pleased to be able to, to discuss with you the ways in which donors engage in working on women's economic empowerment and gender equality more broadly. I'm going to try to cover three things. The context of the COVID-19 crisis, which I think is pressing and is teaching us a lot of lessons about what's happening in terms of the gender equality agenda. Um, I'll discuss with you a bit of the work that we do in terms of existing investments and engagement on women's economic empowerment. 
and what we are able to share and what we can measure and what might be harder to measure. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about some of our own future plans related to work on women's economic empowerment. I think I should begin just briefly by explaining to you that at the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, we have the Development Assistance Committee where there are 30 bilateral donors working on development assistance and they wield about $153 billion worth of aid at our last calculation released uh, earlier this year in April. And essentially, this is the place where we are able to use something we call the creditor reporting system to follow the investments of the donors in many different fields. And my team is responsible for following the investments that are made in gender equality and women's empowerment work across all of the donor agencies. So we are able to take a look at everything from what are the flows in general by using something called the gender equality policy marker which allows us to see when gender equality is integrated into other social sectors uh, and when gender equality work is done in its own right on gender related issues and not just mainstream or mainstreamed into other sectors. So this is something that we follow quite closely. And today we have reached the point of about $44 billion worth of aid being invested in gender equality across the donor agencies, which is an all time high but it still remains 42% of the investments that, um, that are made in, in aid in general. So it's still not over half of aid uh, investing in gender equality. So there's quite a lot more that we need to be doing. Um, just to speak on the COVID-19 part of the questions just for one moment, I think it's important to note that the challenges are rising for everyone in this context and with rising poverty, women and girls will definitely be uh, confronted with uh, much more difficulty in some ways, as we know that they are disproportionately affected. What we tried to do uh, earlier this year when the COVID crisis hit was to bring all of the donor agencies together in something we call the gender net, which is the Development Assistance Committee's network on gender equality, which we manage in my team. And we asked them, you know, what are you seeing happening? 70% of women are working in the health uh, workforce today. What is happening at the moment in terms of integrating gender equality sort of into the response, into economic stimulus packages. What do we need to be thinking about? How are you managing this in your agencies? Many of them came back to tell us that they were trying to have very flexible funding mechanisms in order to be able to get out support quickly and easily to um, more important uh, areas, infectious disease in the healthcare area. But we also realized that a lot of the investments in spending are relatively low and that gender equality was not necessarily being paid attention to enough in this particular effort. Um, just to provide one example, enhancing gender equalities is not only the right thing to do, but it's smart economics, right? So we, we've been trying to continually make this argument that, for example, if women participated fully in the economy identically to men, this could add $28 trillion to or 26% of annual GDP um, by 2025. This analysis suggests that even the potential could be higher in developing countries. Now, this piece is a is an effort uh, by um, an organization called McKinsey that did some research a few years ago on this question. And I think it's, it's one where we need to keep that argument in mind as we think about the COVID-19 crisis and consider ways that we actually reaching gender equality and empowering women and girls will be a real factor for growth. And we can try to take a step back and have a much more um, long-term structural approach to change. So I just wanted to cover that briefly on the COVID-19 part. I think importantly as well, when we think more generally, um, Tomas acts much more quickly and in the economic and productive sectors, we have much more that we could do. So I would just put that on the table as an area that we should be considering. Um, it's also uh, interesting to note that in this particular field of working on women's economic empowerment, we can um, think quite a bit about what all of us I think are facing within this current crisis too, the unpaid care and domestic work concerns. Um, in, in my team, we've done some research over the last few years on uh, unpaid care and domestic work and the importance of trying to redistribute and really try to get to a situation where we address uh, what women face in developing countries, but also in, in all of our countries now on this particular uh, challenge and agenda. So I think that I just wanna make sure that we remember to raise that when it comes to the discussions and the debates. And I can talk more about the findings of that when we come to it. 
Um, when it comes to thinking about the future and actions for the long term, um, you asked about what actions do we wish to see for women's economic empowerment in the immediate and the longer term. I said just a few things related to where we are now in this particular context. But uh, Development Co Cooperation has made some progress in supporting women's economic empowerment, and there's a need to adopt a more holistic approach, we feel. We feel that there's scope to, to increase the funding, as I just described to you in this area, and in particular also in the banking and the business sectors and trying to reach greater financial inclusion. So in addition to some of the things I referred to, energy infrastructure, those economic and productive sectors, we really feel that much more can be done as well in terms of financial inclusion. It's, it's clear that the focus, for instance, back to the energy sector could be strengthened. Only 14% of aid is really integrating gender equality in that sector. So there are quite a few areas where we can make change happen. Development policies and programs on women's economic empowerment could be further adapted to this current reality and DAC members, countries working on their own reforms can do a lot to ensure that there's more impact on the ground in developing countries with which they're working. In addition, there's, there's significant scope for us to use a fuller range of development finance instruments. So I referred to this moment where we convened the membership and we had some discussions earlier in the year about how to um, do uh, a better job, I would say, on thinking of, of options for financing gender equality in developing countries. And there's a growing community working with official development assistance flows, which I've described to you so far, and going beyond that and looking for engagements with development finance institutions, the private sector, governments, um, and, and aid donors, where you can actually create partnerships that bring more uh, and greater value to this area. And we realize that in this a uh, decade for action, if you will, are, are 10 years on the way to uh, the sustainable development goal accomplishments that we seek to achieve by 2030. This is a very good time to be focusing our minds on what we think blended finance could do, how we could bring these kinds of what some call gender lens investing models together more effectively in the future. So this is one thing that we're thinking about quite a bit and we have done a small piece that can also be shared afterwards um, on this particular sort of landscape for increasing investments in gender equality. Then finally, I would say on the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the fifth anniversary of the SDGs, we, we really have a political momentum time that I think we should try to seize together to advance, really capitalize on this moment. Uh, we could also be looking at ways to partner together more effectively. What we do in the DAC GenderNet is come together around issues and areas of collective concern or action. And for instance, what we have done over the last year um, and really two years, I would say altogether, we've developed a new standard on ending sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment in development cooperation and humanitarian assistance activities. And we monitor this recommendation. And this was a, an ambitious recommendation that came out at the time where it was very much uh, on the forefront and the minds of many organizations with incidences that happened in early 2018. I only stop on this to say that what we can do is set standards, higher standards in our work on gender equality more broadly. And this is something that we try to do among the, the governments that we're collaborating with. The, um, the other things I think I should just inform you of to be sure that as we start to, to talk to each other about some of the more concrete areas for activities and programs for women's economic empowerment. Uh, we are also working uh, over time in the OECD on several global initiatives on women's economic empowerment, one of which is the Equal Pay International Coalition and the Generation Equality Forum's Coalition on Economic Justice and Rights. So these are some efforts that we, we have been working on as the OECD and will continue to engage in actively as we go forward uh, on the strategic um, advancement of this community over the coming months. We also have key times when we can check back in and work together both in the academic community and among the donors uh, to help make change happen. And I think we have the Commission on the Status of Women in March and a celebration of Beijing Plus 25 delayed slightly, unfortunately, by the situation that we're in, but we will also have a uh, convening of the generation equality events that will come up in June and that will provide a great opportunity. So we're um, really pleased to, to be able to uh, be part of this conversation. 
but also to be able to work with all of the donors to move things ahead. And, and I'm happy now, I'll wrap up, but I'm, I'm very happy to be able to learn from my other uh, distinguished panelists what they've been doing and how they're working uh, in their particular areas as well. So with that, I think I'll wrap up now. Thank you, Tomas. I hope the timing wasn't too long. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for uh, the perspective uh, from the international uh, organization, which is really important uh, in our uh, for the field of focus uh, of uh, this panel discussion. Now I would like to ask uh, Maxi to bring her perspective on our question. Thanks, Tamash. And uh, thank you, Lisa, so much for this really um, inspiring uh, presentation, so much energy, so many good ideas. Um, so as Tomas said, my name is Maxi. I've worked in the space of gender equality and women's empowerment for about 16 years, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I spent about six years in Malawi, three years in Tanzania, and I'm currently based in Mozambique. Um, I have worked mostly as a consultant, as director of Just Impact, developing gender strategies, providing technical advice as a gender, sort of uh, on-call gender advisor. But I've also been employed uh, at times for uh, UNICEF and also for the International Labour Organization, always working on gender. So I've done my time inside and I've done my time outside different kinds of organizations. And so I'm just thrilled. I'm so excited by the questions Tamash has proposed. And I have chosen my favorite, which is the first question. Because in my time in this space, I have seen too much withering away. I've seen some great policy commitments. And then you just wonder where does it all go when you see the work on the ground. So if I may, I have a short, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I would like to share. So I have taken the liberty to slightly rephrase the first question. And I'm asking, are we mainstreaming or are we outstreaming gender equality and women's empowerment? And please uh, do take what I say with a pinch of salt. My aim is here to provoke discussion. So I'm trying to be a little bit provocative to, to really get us thinking about what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? What can we do better? So this is my question. And um, I reflected at what we usually do in the organizations that I've seen and that I've read about. So we do a lot of awareness raising. We tell people how important gender equality is, how we must care about human rights of women and social justice. So we appeal to their heart. We also develop a lot of tools and we do training on gender equality because gender mainstreaming means that sort of everybody has to do gender. So for everybody to do gender, we try and persuade them, we make them understand that this is important. And we also give them the technical tools and the sort of the technical know-how through training to actually do the job. So we are, in a sense, trying to win hearts and minds. And please, by all means, this is important. But what that, math, what that leads to, I find, or I have found in my work, is that think about an organization, and maybe as I'm speaking to the audience, I wish I could see gender person. You may have been the gender person. I used to be a gender person in various organizations. So you are in the middle of an organization. Often it's one person. What do you do every day? So as I said, you will be developing training packages and tools for your colleagues. You're going to try and win hearts and minds with awareness raising work. You'll also probably be asked to develop the business case for gender equality in whatever organization you're in. And this is important. And I know, Lisa, you spoke to this uh, quite, quite, I mean, really excellently, how, you know, if an organization is interested in growth, we tell the organization, you have to involve women for growth. Or as I was advising on a, on a market systems approach program uh, for DFID in Malawi, people were interested in, um, growing oil seeds. So they wanted, to, they wanted to know that if they invest in women, they will increase their, their crop yields in cotton, for example. But when you develop the business case, you are not asked, or you're actually not supposed to say women's empowerment matters because it matters. You're using other arguments, instrumental types of arguments. 
So you'll be asked to do a lot of persuasion. And this is particularly important because in many organizations, gender people often don't have many reporting lines. They don't have many people reporting to them. They are often put in a, in a horizontal space. So they have to work with maybe the entire organization. They have to get people to do things on gender, but they have to rely on their ability to persuade because they often don't have people reporting to them who have to do things for them, but they have to persuade and again, win hearts and minds. So you will be, have to be passionate, but please, and here I'm being provocative, don't be too passionate because if you're too passionate, they might call you a feminist. And in some organizations, and I'm really being provocative here, that, that might discredit you. People might not listen to you. They might just think you're angry. You need to relax. You need to, you know, we are doing really serious work here. You need to relax. Don't be so passionate. Don't be so emotive about your work. So you've got to really, you know, it's a fine line. You have to tread quite carefully. So because you have to do a lot of persuasion, you will have to do a lot of follow-ups to really get people to do what you've asked them to do. Maybe fill in their action plan or report on their work on gender equality. And one thing you will also have to do is follow-ups. And I'm not sure if I've mentioned, but you're going to have to do some follow-ups because people might not respond to your first, second or third email. And when you finally find a colleague who has responded to your request, you're probably going to make them the gender champion. This can be exhausting. This work can be exhausting. And often the gender people in organizations end up feeling exhausted. So what do we have to do? I'm asking myself, do we need to stop making gender equality an option or a nice to have? In other words, do we need to stop apologizing for asking to have gender equality taken seriously? And by that, I mean, and I have done it. A donor is asking for the gender report, the annual gender report and what the project has done. So do you have to go to your colleagues to get the data? And I have often rolled my eyes and said, I'm so sorry, I know you're so busy, but I really need this data. You know, the donor is asking for it. It's not me, it's the donor who's asking. So I'm really sorry that I'm asking you to take gender seriously. Maybe we have to stop apologizing. Maybe we have to stop saying, maybe you can do gender, but you know, no worries if not, if you're too busy doing your day job. And concretely, what I feel that we really need to do more of, we need to strengthen accountability at two levels, the individual level, inside organizations and the organizational level. And by that, for example, at the individual level, what I mean is gender equality work cannot be a nice to have. If you work in an international development organization, whether it's an NGO, whether it's a bilateral donor or a UN agency, it's not an option. You have signed up to something, to an ethos that includes gender equality as a value in and of itself. So what I've seen, and I haven't seen it very often, but an unapologetic requirement to, to uh, mainstream gender and to really do gender sensitive and gender responsive work included in every staff's performance assessment. And when we do that, we also need to do that with a plenty of guidance for managers of how to actually assess this. Because it's not enough to say, have you done something on gender? And your colleague says, yes, I have, and you tick the box. You really need to provide guidance to staff and managers on how you assess someone's performance on gender responsive work. Very importantly, at the organizational level, we see so much withering. So yes, we need to set standards and that's important, but we do quite well, I feel. Um, and I've done quite a bit of research also looking at some very large multilateral donors in Malawi, for example beautiful standards, but we need to see them through. So we need to really be sure that we have our policies, we have our guidelines, but we also reflect it all the way down to when it comes to, for example, evaluating proposals from NGOs who are then going to implement the work. That evaluation sheet where a desk officer will be assessing proposals received locally, 
that evaluation sheet needs to have meaningful questions on gender. And the question mustn't be, is gender mainstreamed, yes or no? So we need accountability and we need skills. Gender is a hard skill. And I've seen it too many times that people who, um, I mean, I was, when I was 27, I was a junior professional officer for a UN agency and I was appointed gender focal point for no real reason other than being a woman. And people felt like I had the time. You wouldn't ask someone who likes bridges or who's walked over a bridge once to build you a bridge. You would ask an engineer who has experience. The same goes for gender. Gender is something that people have learned how to do. So we need to take that seriously. It's complex and context specific. Thank you. So thanks, Maxi, for a wonderful presentation and for this proposal to make uh, to make uh, uh, from the gender person to to make the gender person into a gender post in a way. And now uh, I would like to hear uh, from Manda, Wanda Maufras Chernohorska, her contribution from her perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tomasz, for passing me the floor. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wanda uh, Mofra Chernohorska, and I work as a sociologist at the Czech Women's Lobby, and I'm also a chairwoman of the Gender Expert Chamber of the Czech Republic. And before I start, just let me thank to the conference organizers for inviting me to such interesting event. I'm very much honored to share the floor with so many accomplished and experienced professional, professionals. And uh, I'm thinking uh, probably Maxi was cut short due to, uh, due to uh, some connection issues. So uh, I don't know if, if there is something that Maxi would like to add to her presentation or shall I continue and we're going to come back to uh, her points during the discussions? Yes, I see it this way. Okay, great. Um, so anyway, uh, my take on the gender equality agenda in development work derives to a large extent from my experience working for people in needs Syria mission in Turkey and northern Iraq. For those of you who don't know, people in need is the biggest the Czech as well as Central Eastern European uh, NGO working in the development field. And over there, I was focusing on strengthening the mission's capacity, building processes and anti-harassment mechanisms. So in another words, I was working with the national staff or local team on strengthening their potential and capacities, empowering their positions so they are treated well and fairly and know how to deal with issues such as discrimination or sexual harassment, shall those ever arise. So my perspective, perspective is very, um, let's say, uh, ground-based. Uh, so based on that experience and my recent work on how and how well or not so well the EU funds are being used in the Czech Republic for promotion of gender equality, I'd like to make a few, let's say three, remarks on how to better incorporate women's empowerment and gender equality in the practice of international development. So, I mean, I think it's it's fair to say, and, and from what uh, uh, the previous panelists were discussing, uh, it's evident that gender equality and women's empowerment have become sort of an indispensable part of development and humanitarian work, that sort of international donors and agencies are making it mandatory for organizations and other key actors applying for funding to really incorporate gender equality related agenda into their projects and programs um, and, and rightly so. But I think it's also important to ask to what extent are we or are the donors looking into the organization's overall gender related policies and systems, whether they're assessing how the organization works and empower their local staff at the missions and how the organization incorporates gender in all their projects and day-to-day -day functioning, rather than focusing only on a gender perspective uh, being implemented within their projects and programs. 
Um, in uh, my sort of own experience with the development and humanitarian world, it, it's not that I wouldn't see enough uh, projects and programs tackling gender related issues. There's been many of them. Um, the problem, or let's say room for improvement lies somewhere else. So when we ask the question that Tomáš was mentioning at the very beginning, how are the concepts of women's empowerment and gender equality used in the practice of international development, my reply would be the view on gender issues is often too narrow and, and too restricting. So what do I mean by that? So we often see gender perspective being highlighted especially in the Czech Republic, uh, only in projects and programs that are dealing directly with the very, in quotation marks, gender obvious issues. So those would be projects uh, supporting better access of marginalized girls to education in Nepal, or supporting healthcare for women in DRC, or tackling gender-based violence in Mongolia. And those projects are great and they are important. But what we need is also equally strong focus on integration of gender perspective in all thematic areas and stages of the development work. And that is something that is not being sufficiently, sufficiently done, especially in uh, the Czech context. So gender mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming, and again, gender mainstreaming. Uh, there are many projects or, or there are many projects in infrastructure or agriculture gone wrong where uh, thinking uh, that when we are building, for example, a water whale or support, supporting local farmers, we don't really need to reflect on the, the gender dimension of these projects. But the thing is that we do and uh, as an example, I was once evaluating a project where the implementer was supposed to reflect on the potential impact of his project, which was about building an underpass. And the implementer claimed the gender perspective is not relevant here, it's just a construction work. And then the community ended up with an underpass that was almost never used by women, as it was poorly lit and perceived as unsafe to walk through. So it's important that both donors as well as organizations approach gender as a horizontal and sort of cross-cutting issue that should be reflected in all projects. And I know that's a, a sort of a sentiment that is being repeatedly, uh, repeatedly uh, sort of mentioned within uh, key policies and, and sort of like in, a, in, in a various statements, but in reality, we don't really see that much work being done in this department, uh, like I said, especially in this, uh, in this region. Like we have a, a lot of work to do in this department. Um, secondly, it is also important that organizations or implementers in the development context first ensure that they themselves have strong gender equality policies and processes in place that work both at their HQs as well as at their missions level. Like we often tend to focus on projects and programs, but we fail to assess whether and to what extent the implementing organizations swept, uh, like uh, whether, whether they have uh, enough women in their top management, uh, whether, what are their work-life balance policies, uh, what are their anti-discrimination and anti-sexual harassment policies, and how do they deal with complaints at HQ as well as uh, at their missions? How many complaints of such sorts uh, have been reported? Um, none. Well, that uh, tells us something too. So I would say that this is not sufficiently present, uh, both when it comes to Czech state administration and, uh, and the development NGO sector, or it's something where uh, I would like to see more work to be done and, and uh, uh, more sort of spotlight to be shed. Uh, thirdly, uh, it is important to work and uh, empower the national staff. I mean, this is something that is really close to my heart and I, I think I, I cannot stress this enough uh, that we need to empower the local staff, not only when it comes to their technical skills, but also when it comes to recognizing the importance of gender equality uh, but within, within the actual context, the importance for their own, let's say, professional and personal lives, 
for their communities and the work they do. Um, I really second what Maxi was saying when it comes to gender expertise. Uh, I think it's also a sentiment widely shared in the Czech Republic, uh, and we've been dealing with that at the gender expert chamber quite often, that uh, everyone seems to be an expert on gender issues uh, because gender somehow uh, concerns all of us. Uh, but the same way as me personally, I'm, I'm no expert in linguistics only because I use language and I speak and I write. Uh, I also had to undergo a, a certain sort of training to be able to think and, and reflect on gender related issues. So I would like to see the appreciation of gender experts uh, in the Czech Republic and, and worldwide being, uh, being more present. Um, I would also like to see gender expertise um, not only being brought to external experts that sort of parachute himself or herself uh, to the local community for a couple of weeks or months, as is often the case, to rapid needs assess to do rapid needs assessment or project monitoring and evaluation, but it needs to be built on the ground level. Shall it last? And before I pass the floor to another panelist. Uh, let me just make a last note as I want to make sure that we have enough time for the discussion. I think that when discussing how to promote gender equality abroad, it is important to say without uh, being overly negative that the Czech Republic still has long way to go when it comes to tackling gender equality domestically. Czechia has been scoring very poorly in the Global Gender Gap Report as well as in the EU Gender Equality Index. So unless gender issues will be taken seriously and dealt with expertly on the domestic playing field, uh, really the improvement of development assistance and sufficient incorporation of gender perspective will be inadequate as well. And, and the progress will not be uh, as fast as it, uh, as, it, as it could be and as it should be. So that's all from my side, thank you. Thank you, Wanda, for, for this very interesting uh, contribution, which has been reflecting on the Czech perspective. And now I would like to welcome Michala Marksova Tomenova, who can add her perspective from within the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, so hello, everybody. Thank you for organizing this. And thank you for the floor. Uh, well, uh, so my name is Michaela Marksova, and uh, I must say I worked for about 10 years uh, as a head of Czech NGO called Gender Studies, or Gender Studies Centrum. Uh, and then I worked in various positions within the public administration, and I also was a minister of labor and social affairs. And uh, because I uh, became a minister of social and labor affairs, uh, after working for the women's NGO, I was immediately labeled as feminist. And believe me, I had to apologize in a way for many times, trying to say that although I'm feminist, um, uh, I'm normal. So, um, so I would like to say that the, in, in general, the, the policy of the Czech state towards equality of men and women um, um, is connected uh, with the general agenda of equality. And, um, you know, it started in this country uh, being taken officially uh, with the process before entering the EU. And I must say, you know, I'm grateful for it that EU forced us to create the first ever, ever kind of institution in a way dealing with uh, equality of men and women. It was a small department uh, placed at the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. And then it developed to, um, to a national action plan or later governmental strategy on equality of uh, men and women. Um, and we also have uh, already for many years um, at each ministry a gender focal point um, and you know this action plan is going to be checked and revised uh, and so on but 
it still remains mostly um, focused on the ministries, okay, and their agenda, um, and mostly on numbers of women in various positions, uh, and it's still sort of formal thing. And I must say that in you know nowadays political situation, um, it's not going like the development or the attitude towards issues of equality of uh, women and men. It's not getting better, but I must say that it's getting worse. And right now uh, we have in the parliament uh, debate about the budget for 2021. Uh, and again, like in previous years, uh, several political parties or individual members of parliament attack the money being given to NGOs and some of them focus especially on so-called gender uh, NGOs and they just want to take the money in the budget away from them and give it somewhere else and so I must say it's it's not nice um, and um, now focusing on the foreign policy well first I think that there was a big progress uh, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, focused um, inside uh, on equality of men and women and there was a big uh, breakthrough uh, with this act uh, on foreign service uh, which really solved uh, a number of long-term issues for women in the foreign service mostly related uh, to maternity uh, i would say that this condition before this act uh, for women who dared to give birth while whilst being sent abroad were really uh, awful. It was uh, actually like a punishment uh, to give birth to a child. Um, but then the act um, uh, which came into force, uh, force um, on the July 1st, 2017, uh, changed uh, these uh, conditions. And now in this case, we are okay. Uh, then if we look at numbers uh, of women in various positions, I mean, it's plus minus okay, but when it comes to uh, ambassadors to heads of mission, then the number is not good at all. It's something about 15, 18%. Uh, and also I must say that, okay, I am a deputy minister, but uh, we have at this ministry seven deputies and two of us, the only women who are uh, deputy ministers, uh, we, you know, we are not under the act of foreign service. We are just, we are called in Czech Republic political deputies and we come and leave with the minister. So when we leave with this minister, we will have here five remaining main, men as deputies. But what is mo most important, of course, for this conference is the agenda uh, of, a real, of being able to promote gender issues uh, gender perspective in the humanitarian and develop, development projects. And I think here, uh, well, as it was said uh, already, uh, uh, we have uh, much to do because I also find it very complicated to do this gender mainstreaming perspective. And I, I think that the example uh, with the new uh, way um, which, was, which was said, is that that's exactly what is it about because we are able to do this nice project against violence and some maybe education of women and girls uh, but i was for example questioning when i saw that the czech republic is sending money to afghanistan to agriculture projects i was questioning how we uh, see what we do um, towards gender equality in this project because I can imagine a lot of uh, gender perspective in uh, agriculture projects in Afghanistan, but actually the you know the answers, uh, well, they were not satisfying for me because they actually we didn't know as I uh, as I discovered. Um, so, well, you know, just I can only conclude with the hope uh, that we manage uh, to educate 
the people responsible uh, for the um, for distributing of this aid um, in this field, and it's really difficult. And it was always difficult in this country. And as I said, this political situation in the past several years makes it even more difficult. Because if you speak, <coughs> sorry, really, whenever you start to speak about issues of gender equality, sorry, um, then you are looked at, at somebody who is really strange. Um, so let's hope it will be better. But of course, even this political situation, uh, it doesn't mean uh, that was this eight minutes <laughs> on my mobile. And uh, it doesn't mean that we should give up. We should never give, give up because I think that the gender mainstreaming perspective is extremely important in the developing aid and the developing projects. Thank you. Development projects, sorry. Uh, thank you, Michaela. Uh, and uh, now I would like to encourage our viewers to ask their questions either, either through video or through writing. And uh, in the meantime, uh, I uh, have a question which uh, is directed uh, especially at Lisa, but also others could comment. Uh, on this, and the question comes as follows. When we look at the OECD Development Cooperation Directorate, it's uh, proclaiming its role to be to promote, to set up principles and standards, to monitor and to su support. But how is it with the power of the OECD to change something in the national policies? Uh, Certainly, there is some influence, some observable change in course of time that you can see. And my question is, uh, uh, if you could uh, take us a bit inside of the, those processes, don't worry, no one really listens to us. It's just between of us. Uh, how this, that, does this uh, change happen? What practical or political instruments work? What does not work? what factors are decisive? How are you contributing to a change? Do you want me to respond now or do you want to take other questions? I can, I can do that or whatever you- well, Yeah, if you, if you would uh, respond now, that would be great, yeah. Okay, so I think, I mean, um, this change that we're hoping to see is, is in some ways um, very complex. And I think that it's hard to create one attribution, right? You can't be sure that, that um, the donor agency alone is making all of those changes. But I think in terms of the way that we're working, um, one of the bigger sort of sea change instruments that we have has been the gender equality policy marker. Um, because we have this database, the creditor reporting system, where we see the spend, right? So this is not an impact related set of data set, but it's a set about the investments in gender equality. What this allows us to do is to create strategic policy analysis to help encourage the donors to spend in different areas more or to understand where they're really lacking. So this particular tool, I would say, is one of the more powerful ones. And we've been able to say, over time, uh, how investments in gender equality have risen. So even if we're not completely satisfied with the way that mainstreaming gender equality works, and we need to have a wider conversation, which we are having, and I think many in the community, as we heard Maxi and Misha both said, um, we need to think about integrating gender equality and really how we really embed it in the other sector activities, right? I think we need a more nuanced conversation about it, but this mainstreaming effort comes from the Beijing Platform for Action. And I think since 1995, we've seen that it is possible now to have more investments in gender equality in other sectors. And this tracking mechanism that we have allows us to tell you what those numbers look like. Um, they remain actually pretty low, I would say, in many ways. 42% is great um, of aid, but there could, be, there could be quite a bit more. That leaves a lot of scope still. So 
Um, we have a sense that we both want to see more dedicated gender equality spending, so larger portfolios and institutional arrangements and professionalization of the cadre that is a very professional group uh, working together in larger entities on gender equality inside agencies to also be able to punch heavily, I would say, within the sectors as well, right? Um, or actually negotiate, I would call it, is what really happens. But I do think we need to be able to have um, a better space there. So then I'll go to the policy instruments and tools that we can use. What we're doing now is it's been 20 years since the Development Assistance Committee updated its collective guidelines on gender equality and women's empowerment. So we're in the process of updating those guidelines now. We're surveying all the members about their strategic frameworks, their policies, their institutional arrangements, their numbers of staff, um, how they evaluate, how they assess, and what's happening basically in the internal systems. And we're going to be working with the donors collectively to establish guidance that can be used by the governments themselves, but that we think will have an interest to other types of actors in this field as well. So I'll stop with that, but those are the, the quick things I think that, that help us to make change happen uh, in this venue, which I think can be used to, quite strategically. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask other speakers if they could react to this and especially to what is their uh, experience with uh, the gender marker? Yeah, if they see uh, any impact or and how does it work? Actually, so we can perhaps start with Maxi because she was uh, uh, she was disconnected. So now she can. Yeah, thank you. I'm so sorry. My computer decided to shut down, but I I did make I think all the points I wanted to make, and maybe I can answer your question, Tomas, but really from the ground perspective. And I think I, I haven't really used the gender marker, the OECD gender marker as such myself, but I just to show maybe an example of how difficult it is to assess how we're doing on gender is I would like to give an example from when I was working in Malawi as a gender advisor on a DFID funded market systems approach program that aimed to promote oil seats in Malawi. And um, one oil seed that was focused on largely was cotton. And I don't know if you guys know, but cotton is a very, a very powerful cash crop. So it's quite a, it's a commercial crop and it requires quite a lot of inputs. So it's in the Malawi context, the sub-Saharan context, dominated by men, because often men are the ones who are seen to be responsible for commercial activity. Now the project thought, hmm, so what are we going to do about women? How can we mainstream? How can we, no, how can we make it a women's empowerment project as well? So the idea was, let us add another crop, a crop that's dominated by women and that grows in very similar conditions. So the idea was sesame. And it's true, sesame in Malawi is a woman's crop it's to this day still. It's mainly seen as a food crop. So therefore women are responsible for it. It grows in identical conditions as cotton and often is already grown in cotton fields. So great, can we tick the box? Can we tell the world we've done uh, women's economic empowerment or certainly been gender responsive because we've added sesame. When I was doing an assessment of the project, what I found was that the project signed, uh, it was a contract farming project. So cotton companies signed contracts with cotton farmers to give them good quality inputs at a competitive price with the agreement that the cotton farmers would sell their crops, their good quality cotton to the cotton companies at the end of the season. So that was the idea. So contracts were also signed for sesame. But what happened was, is the company decided to just extend and then uh, make an addendum to the cotton contracts. And obviously, as I said before, cotton is a male dominated crop. Cotton contracts were held by men in the household. So since they just extended the contracts for cotton, for, including sesame, it was the men who signed the sesame contracts. And what I found is that the women in the households who were still the ones doing all the work on sesame often did not even know their husbands had signed the contracts. What also happened was that the training the company gave 
on growing sesame was obviously given to the contract holders who were the men. So the wrong people were trained because the men didn't grow the sesame, it was the women and the men didn't pass on the knowledge. And what actually happened is the inputs given for sesame were in the end often used by the men for cotton. They didn't even make it to the wives to use them for sesame. Needless to say, the project failed. It didn't even achieve its economic in, in, in objectives in growing good quality sesame, let alone uh, actually you know, contributing to women's empowerment. So just being the devil's advocate, it's so difficult, but we have to be so careful the devil is in the detail. Thank you, Maxi. And uh, now, uh, if other speakers would like to react, to perhaps reflect on their uh, experience with the gender marker and all these other sophisticated tools of increasing gender sensitivity of gender development projects, uh, they are very, well, very much welcome. Perhaps, Wanda, do you have any experience with that? I think I'm just going to make a general comment, not specifically on the marker, but on the way we sort of uh, um, assess and evaluate um, the impact of the projects and, and programs. And it's going to sort of um, connect back to what I was saying before. Um, because even the example that Maxi was saying is a testament of how um, even if we have sort of a good intentions, if we don't ensure that we have a, a gender expertise, that we have a, a local expertise, and that we have a technical expertise, the projects can go wrong. Um, I think uh, it's often, often when we are sort of uh, assessing a uh, project from gender perspective, like seeing, seeing the consequences or seeing the, the gender dimension of, uh, of the implementation or of the interventions that we do requires some sort of what we call in sociology, sociological Im imagination. So this would be a sort of, let's say, gender oriented imagination. Like you really, you really and it's a, it's a sort of an expertise, it's a, it's a job, uh, you really need to think carefully about how all the steps uh, that you do within the project affect the local community. But uh, it's not only about the project itself, it's also about how the organization function. And I really, I don't want to repeat myself, but I think it's, it's a fallacy to sort of expect that uh, we as as a, as a let's say donors or organizations coming either from the EU or uh, from uh, the Anglo-American world uh, have uh, what it takes to sort of uh, design a quality project and to provide a good intervention on the local level. Like often, um, often uh, not only that we don't have enough, uh, enough expertise on the ground, but we also don't have uh, the proper understanding of, uh, of uh, sort of what, what it takes, what are all the consequences uh, when, uh, when it comes to gender assessment. And I think this, uh, this sentiment uh, is, also, is also present here in the Czech Republic. I myself was, uh, together with other colleagues, part of uh, a round tables when it comes to, and we were discussing with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the development of the new, uh, the, the new NAP, the new action plan for women, peace and security. And uh, so we were invited to this um, sort of round table. And it was me and other colleagues from um, what, what could be called uh, gender or feminist oriented organizations. And when we ask where are the, where are the representatives from the uh, development and humanitarian organizations, we've been told that they have a separate, uh, that they have a separate round table. So when we were sort of commenting on the, on the policy paper, on the proposal, discussing with the uh, people from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we are of course grateful that the civil society was invited to give its input on uh, this uh, 
this important proposition, uh, we were somehow separated from the development and humanitarian context because it is still perceived here that, okay, we're gonna ask about the gender uh, issues uh, representative of the gender and feminist organizations. And then we're gonna ask the development and humanitarian representatives uh, about their input. And then we're gonna somehow put it all together. Well, this is not how it works. This is not how it works when you're putting together uh, uh, such an important uh, sort of policy. And it doesn't work uh, as Maxi's example showed on a, on a local level when you are sort of a designing project. You need you, you need all this expertise together. You need, you need uh, expertise in gender and you need expertise in, in development context, including the technical skills and knowledge of the, of the local sort of nuances. So let's just, let's just my, 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 conclusion, uh, my conclusion of this would be, let's just ensure that we uh, we sort of work together on on these uh, on these issue collectively and and don't separate the gender technical and development expertise. Thank you very much, Wanda. And now I would uh, like to turn to Michaela if she has some reflection on the gender marker or similar markers or tools uh, and. Uh, uh, also, we have uh, the first question from the audience, and I will just pose it here so you can react uh, together. And the question is, what are the reasons in your view for the slow progress on gender equality while we have evidence showing economic gains of systematically including women? <laughs> well... Um, so, so the question <laughs> is very difficult and connected to the previous issue. Uh, in my eyes, it was only a big hope uh, and it was very important when uh, we had uh, some, um, uh, you know, some agenda or some guidelines from abroad, uh, which we as a Czech Republic are not able to ignore. Uh, I think without uh, women, peace and uh, security and without, I don't know, CEDO and Beijing plus five and whatever, we, we won't be, we won't even uh, make it so far um, as a country in, in several issues concerning gender equality. Uh, and um, although the practical, um, use is, of course, that's another question, and we hear it um, at this debate, uh, that we, there is still uh, plenty, there is still a long way to go. Uh, well, concerning this slow progress, you know, <laughs> I must say, I don't know, and it makes me very sad because I spent like, I don't know, last 15, 20 years of my life working in this field uh plus minus and actually it's actually i think it's it's worse it's not about slow progress it's about the regress and this is an issue which uh, really really makes me extremely sad uh but i don't know what to do with it because uh really when you talk with politicians with important people uh with journalists uh people who are opinion makers, it's like hopeless. Of course, you have many, mostly women, not, not all women, but many women and some men who are aware uh, of the situation. Uh, but uh, the majority uh, of the opinion makers, uh, you know, for them, it is just not an issue. And uh, as I already said, it's, it's now even worse. So it, now it's the, the gender equality is something which is um, it's, it's very it's an issue which which is being aggressively attacked as something which is totally useless and wrong and I, I really don't know how to deal with it I must tell you uh, thank you for this honest answer and uh, I would like to turn it into a question for Lisa uh, Lisa what is in your opinion, the reason for 
the slow progress or even perhaps in some cases regress and uh, how uh, how would you uh, assess uh, the donor landscape for example in europe who are the front runners uh, who are those who are improving and working on themselves and who are those who uh, you would mark as regressing And then we have uh, one question, especially for Maxi. Okay, uh, just quickly, I think, um, I mean, I feel the the concern over the backlash over the last several years, I would say that, that we've been experiencing. I think there was a lot of progress for a time. And I think that there's been, you know, regression over the last five years, I would say perhaps a bit more. In my sense, I mean, I'm slightly, um, more optimistic in the sense that I feel that today maybe we do have more tools and more opportunities to make change happen. I, I have the sense that there are more professionals working on gender equality than there were before, but we're doing research on this so we can tell you more. But I feel like um, the, the recognition of the importance of having women um, working, particularly for, for our donor countries in a way um, at an equal level to men in society has become better recognized than in the past. And as some, as part of the question says, you know, if we're making so much progress on that economic front and we're seeing such changes, why are we seeing regressions in other areas? And I think what we need to do is to try to identify what those are, tackle them little by little. Um, there are always political wins which affect this agenda, I would say too. Um, and that's been referred to by all of, of the excellent panelists on this group. I think, you know, we have to navigate those as they come forward um, and, and manage them carefully, right? I think it's, it's not very easy to handle sometimes. Um, the, you know, some of the things that you referred to, Maxi, about um, labeling people and, you know, anyway, I think it's more just that we need to stick to the professional route and ensuring that um, that gender equality professionals are there and working alongside, if not as the agriculture advisors, the infrastructure advisors, the energy advisors, right? I think it's real integration that we need to be thinking about. Um, and then I'm, I'm optimistic because I think that we do have a lot more data than we ever had before. I think the more we can get, the better. Um, there are organizations that are doing more and more to, to try and um, track change. So I think we need to have these conversations about what transformative change would be and what we would like to see more of uh, and work within the development cooperation field to, to you know, make sure that gender equality is part of those discussions about results and transformative change. We'll stop there. Thank you, Lisa. And now the question for Maxi. The question is, Maxi, how would you apply the gender marker tool in the project you just mentioned? That was the project Maxi mentioned when she was giving the example to make it successful. Or what other suitable tool would you recommend? Thanks, Tamash. That's a really good question. I like it. It's forward looking. So next time, what should we do differently? It is difficult because I really love, I should have said, I love the tools like the gender marker because we need those. Yes, they are broad brush instruments, but we need them for big picture accountability. So, but for a detailed project and the problem that I'm seeing on the ground, and it's not just this one example where we fail at the end, at the very the bottom where actually the rubber hits the road, how to pick up on it. I would say from a sort of, gender market tool perspective, two things to look for. One is a really good gender responsive, a gender analysis done at the beginning of the project that should have picked up on some of those details. So, and there wasn't one done. It was a very simplistic approach. Sesame is a woman's crop, therefore we add sesame equals we are gender responsive. A gender analysis would have probably picked up on those intricacies. So that would give you an indication. Maybe that would have, if we'd asked the question and there had been a gender analysis, we may have gone better. The second one is having a gender responsive ME framework. And not just an evaluation because that's at the end. That's what I did and I found that it wasn't good, but that was at the end of the project. So really a monitoring system 
that is thoroughly not gender sensitive enough or definitely not just gender disaggregated but even that you know what even a gender disaggregated m e framework would have picked up because they would have noticed that in the trainings there are only men and in the trainings if you're training on sesame and you're doing that because it's a woman's crop you would have expected more women so even if they've had the, even if they had had a very simplistic counting heads kind of m e framework that would have already picked up on it. But had they had a very gender responsive m and &E framework that would have certainly picked up on those problems during implementation. So those two, gender analysis, gender responsive m and &E framework. But obviously what would have stopped the entire thing also from happening is having an empowered gender, technical gender specialist on the ground who can make her voice or her, his voice heard throughout the process. I don't know if that answers the question or contributes at least to an answer uh thank you thank you very much now uh i would like to really start uh, wrap, wrapping up and uh, i would like to turn to wanda and ask her about uh, in her position what is her uh, to just respond short you know what is her experience with the pushback against women's rights and gender equality and if she has some uh techniques or uh, ways how to counter the pushback and push back against the pushback if you know what i mean uh, i'm sure you know yeah yeah uh no it's it's an excellent question and it uh, sort of uh, is tightly connected to what lisa was talking about uh sure i do agree that there's been a significant progress in the czech republic especially after the succession in the european union and there's been lots of work done good work done uh, thanks to the European investment and structural funds when it comes to gender equality, but the progress could have been better. And uh, I second what uh, Ms. Marksova Tominova was saying that uh, there's been even a regression. And I think in order to fight this regression, we need to understand where it's coming from. Um, we've seen a rise of a concept called um, sort of gender ideology. Uh, which is uh, which is sort of a belief that gender equality is uh, part of this almost conspiracy theory that Brussels is trying to sort of implement or the European Union is trying to impose um on uh, on us on countries uh, it was especially it is especially strong in the central and e eastern european region in the visegrad for this sort of sentiment uh we what we need to do is keep on debunking the disinformation that are tightly connected to this agenda uh, we could witness it for example when uh, discussing the istanbul convention there's been lots of disinformation and myths going on what will the ratification of the convention mean that are simply not true and these disinformation be it about istanbul convention or be it about what gender equality is really about what feminism is really about needs to be debunked not only by the civil society but by the political leaders of uh, this country otherwise uh, the the overall public opinion and and the overall atmosphere will not uh, change any anytime soon i'm sure that the politicians are smart enough to see um, how many uh, how much economic progress has been made thanks to um, uh, thanks to uh, a, a greater gender uh, equality but we just need uh, more sort of data based less disinformation based uh, approach uh, to this to this whole uh agenda and we need also the funding that is flowing here from the european union to be you to be used more systematically with sort of an ongoing and long um goals in mind uh, and not to use 60 percent of the uh, over 60 percent of the european structural and investment fund for uh, a um, kids group and kindergartens that should have been uh, paid for uh, from the national budget so uh, so just to conclude uh, yes there's been a lots of there's been a lots of regression uh, 
but what we need to do is really uh, like keep reminding uh, people that uh, that uh, gender equality is beneficial beneficial for everyone, and it's 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 no conspiracy theory. It's no there there is nothing uh, nothing ideological behind. It's simply about uh, making the society more just and and equal for everyone. Oh, thank you. Thank you for this point. And now I would like to ask uh, Michala uh, Marksvatominova for just one last minute comment on if she has, uh, from her experience, some uh, way how to, some suggestion on how should we deal with this pushback and how to push again the pushback. Well, no, first. Wanda said it all. And second, when I was thinking about it, I, I, I think that there is one important way. Um, all these actors mostly coming from NGOs, but it could be also academia. Um, those actors who should um, uh, strengthen uh, these issues, these ideas, this gender equality means uh, equality for everybody and a better world for everybody. Uh, they need the funds to be able to work on these issues, to work on these analyses uh, and so on. And um, sometimes I think that it, oh, I don't think, I know, uh, it's like more and more difficult uh, to get such funds because, for example, uh, European Social Fund is one of the uh, main resources for such organizations, but the activities uh, which we are doing, do, which we are able to do, um, are limited. They are usually more or less limited to uh, women on the labor market. Um, so for me, for the future, it would really help if we, um, if all those people uh, um, could have really from international organizations, let's say, have some funds which would enable them actually to do uh, the education and enlightenment uh, in this field. Thank you. So thank you for this last word. Uh, just uh, for your interest, uh, we've got one more question. We will not answer it, but I'll, I'll just read it for you. How can we convince stakeholders namely politicians, male and female, to change their attitude towards gender and feminism and related topics. I think that this somehow uh, uh, is somehow a crucial question, how to, how to make the political change. And we can take it home as a homework and think about it. And perhaps next time we see each other and discuss, we can perhaps come with some uh, ideas and answers to this question. Uh, so thank you all, all the speakers, all, all the uh, participants, all, all the viewers, and uh, uh, see you soon at some other event. And uh, I have one more event for you, which is the next panel discussion. So I encourage everyone to go and watch it. It's going to be very interesting about gender issues in uh, sexual and uh, reproductive rights and the uh, international dimension of this agenda. Thank you very much. See you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you, Thank you everyone.